All right, welcome. I'm coming to you, coming to you for the first time by video. Uh, several reasons for it, but the main reason is that I want to make sure nobody misses this. It seemed, seemed to me as I was pondering this possibility that on the first day some people get lost. I've heard some people go to the wrong classroom door. I guess sometimes there's a wrong door and one's locked and one's not, so they miss the class for that. Sometimes they late add whatever. Let's not miss this first day. This is setting up the big picture. I'm the big picture doc. I don't want you to miss the big picture. Uh, so that's the main reason, but there's some others. Uh, for example, in the spring semester, I, hopefully I can use this video again. I usually often have a conference right there that interferes with the first day of class. So hey, multiple birds with the one stone, if you ever heard that phrase. And uh, because one of my philosophies in life is that the fun never ends unless you let it. I'm going to have fun with this, and maybe because I don't have to actually look at anybody while I do this, maybe see the smirks or the frowns or whatever. I'm going to maybe clown around a little bit more than I, than I usually do. Uh, one of the reasons for that is is because I believe that the optimum amount of clowning around is more than zero. In other words, as a purveyor of serious academics with a sense of humor, I actually seriously believe that the sense of humor up to a point, that's why I say the optimal amount, not too much, not too little, up to a point, some clowning around actually enhances the amount that you're likely to learn. For example, if I periodically lapse into Cajun, uh, that may be helpful. I, if I do it too much, you'll groan. For example, one of the keys to the course is to see clarification. See, there's the Cajun uh, whenever you need it. See, it's not my job to shove this material down your throat. You've got a textbook. You've got a bunch of other sources. Heavens, you can Google anything you want and find information that way. Um, there are other economics textbooks you could look at if you want. And you know, there's the main constraint if you have time. You could even look at another lecture of mine from the first day of class from, for this course. I have them posted from back from uh, a year ago. Uh, but I thought I'd record a fresh one for this day and actually assign you to read this one uh, because I think it's a little more lively than the camera shot of me standing in front of a giant lecture hall as I did uh, uh, for uh, fall 2015. All right, so just to kind of get you used to who I am before I actually get into some talking about the economics big pictures and the big ideas that you can read about in your book, uh, set, set things up a little bit. I am, in fact, Dr. Mary Field, Dr. John Mary Field, uh, but I prefer informality, so after we've uh, established that I'm a full-time faculty member and I have office hours and I don't have to run off to some other job after I finish here and, and that I can see you at times other than official office hours and that I'm an email slave so I respond pretty fast to email whether it's through the BB Learn modules or it's just John Maryfield, uh, John Maryfield at UTSA, whatever. Those are all important parts of the formality but then for us to communicate maybe it's important, more important to have informality because while I believe that I'm probably a lot better at this than you are, you're superior. I mean, actually trying to make myself a little taller than I usually am, which is usually plenty. Uh, you're my superior in other ways. See, I have a comparative advantage in economics because that's what I've studied for years and practiced for years after that. But I'm not in your, your superior in any general sense. There are a lot of things you're better at than I am. All right, so on that basis, you don't have to think of me as you know, somebody that you need to talk to really respectfully. The main thing you need to understand is to talk to me often whenever clarification is needed. Uh, and you need to talk to me in a way that works best for you for that clarification of economic concepts. And I'll talk to you about anything you want if you want to seek my idea, uh, my idea, my advice, my ideas about other things other than economics because you think that I'm a good thinker and a good general decision maker. Uh, that would be awesome, you know. I, I'm, I'm honored to help in any way that I possibly can. But definitely, positively, you want to make sure you communicate with whomever works for you to achieve your intellectual growth in this economic area. So that's the way you should choose between your SI, your supplemental instruction leader, the online materials. There are lectures packed into that uh, BB Learn modules that are from all kinds of different people some better than others, some better than others for some students and other students. The other ones are better for, you know, we're diverse. 
So sample all of those materials. And if you get to be attendance challenged, uh, that's sad. Uh, but, uh, but I've tried to get away from making you wish you'd attended class by any means other than lively instruction and discussion, you know, threatening you and all kinds of bad things are going to happen. No, what I've done in this case is kind of reverse myself and made it easier to be absent. I don't want you to be absent. I want you to be present. I think that's still important. But, you know, I've been doing this long enough that it's finally time to recognize the reality uh, of things and say, you know, some people are just going to have spotty attendance and maybe what I should do to earn my money is to make it as easy as possible for you to still thrive in the course. So, you know, again, this lecture, this recorded lecture is part of that because if you didn't make this first day, now you're watching me anyway and hopefully you view that as a positive. Another day that for sure you can count on a video instead of a live lecture is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. It used to be I tried to set up exams for that day thinking, you know, they're not going to show up for a regular lecture that day, or at least a lot of people aren't. There's a high opportunity cost, hit the road for a vacation, you know, whatever. And, you know, I used to think, well, I'm going to get them for that. I'm going to try to make it as hard for them as possible to do that and to make them show up for class, or if not, have an exam that day so that they show up for it. And I've decided, no, I'm getting too old to to have those kinds of attitudes, and maybe it's not even an age thing. Maybe I've just gotten more mature and said, look, they're, a lot of them are just not going to, they're just going to take the hit for missing that day. So why don't I just record a lecture for that day? Pretty smart, huh? And that way you can be ever wherever you want to be and, and still uh, have no excuse for uh, missing the lecture that day. And there'll probably be some other days as I have conferences I have to attend to and whatever. Uh, so this will... I guess it'll be a semi-hybrid course, uh, simply because I have a high opportunity costs at times. Uh, even though I love this job for the flexibility it has, that doesn't mean that there aren't still uh, time conflicts that can't resolve, be resolved by this media. All right, so I prefer that you call me John or Doc, but if, uh, if, if communication works best for you to call me Dr. Merrifield or whatever, that's the bottom line. Communication when necessary, with whom necessary, Get it done, and if informality helps to make you more comfortable talking to me, I like it better. Call me John or call me Doc. Doc might be the sort of, you know, where the lines cross, the optimum, you know, sort of a little formality there, recognizing that in this subject I'm a learned individual and you're not yet. Uh, so anyway, John, Doc, Dr. Me, whatever works. Main thing is to have open lines of communication. Uh, some other guiding principles that, uh, that might uh, be important to, for you to understand is that, uh, that I try to, try to be as available as possible. Now, that being said, if no one wants to see me that day, more than likely, if it's not a scheduled office hour, I might stay home and work on my computer. That saves me, uh, you know, a, a commute and allows me to be around my family in case something comes up where I need to be there. Uh, but if you say you want to talk to me and but it, but my office hours won't work for you, uh, we'll figure out another time to get it done. Don't be restricted by those. As I said, I'm an email slave, uh, which isn't always good. But it's a fact, uh, for now at least, until I uh, address it if I do. So email me, and I'll email you almost immediately uh, as soon as I have my email on, which is, almost, which is most of the time. Uh, I believe in truth and labeling. That's another one of those direct communication things. Let me explain that... Uh, that I'm sort of a type A guy, even though I'm a clown. So that's that truth and label thing. I don't like political correctness. Call it what it is. Uh, be nice about it. You know, be diplomatic. If I'm not serving you, that's another thing to, to call what it is. I say, Doc, it's not working for me. Can you do X, Y, and Z instead? You know, and, and I won't always say yes automatically because, you know, we all live with constraints and have strengths and weaknesses. But, you know, but I'll at least consider it. Okay, so truth and labeling is, I think, helpful to uh, communication, both person to person and you know, to everybody all at the same time. I try to make a positive difference. You know, and part of what that means that it's important to talk about now is if you're in a situation, regardless of why or whatever, try to make something from it. Don't sit there wringing your hands and think, doggone it, economics is a required course. What am I doing in here? I don't need to know this. Uh, I, I beg to differ, by the way, on that. You're surrounded by economics. Everybody that, that, that aims to be as successful husband or wife, not to mention a professional, needs to know how to make 
rational decisions in the best way possible, and economics will help you with that. Hopefully that'll help it uh, go down a little better when you, as many people are concluding, well, economics isn't in the core curriculum anymore. I don't have to take it anymore. Whoa. No, mistake. I know I'm biased in that thing, that conclusion, but uh, yeah, I think it's a mistake. So make the most of any situation you're in. You're here now. Make it work for you. Get as much out of it as you can. And I'm here now, so I'm going to try to make it work for me. And part of my utility function, what makes me tick and why I feel better about some things than others, is uh, if I see intellectual growth occurring in your eyes, boy, does that, does that get me excited. So, you know, that's probably one of the reasons I do what I do. I like selling ideas. I like getting people to understand things. Yeah, I'm human. I wish people agreed with me more often than they, than they do. But no, that's not really what gets me going. What gets me going, positive or negatively, is when somebody doesn't understand something that's important for them to understand. What conclusions and opinions they derive from that is beyond my control, and I don't worry about things I can't control. Okay, and again, guiding principle number three, you've heard a couple times already, the fun never ends unless you let it, and that's really a deadly serious phrase, even though it may sound whimsical. You can decide to be just about as happy as you want to be. Yes, there are tragedies. Yes, there are things that happen that, uh, that uh, knock us down a notch every now and then, but most of the time, you're going to be about as happy as you decide you want to be. So what does that mean in this context? That means make the economics fun. Don't sit there and torture yourself by memorizing something you don't understand and then wondering why you spent umpteen hours studying and still got a C or a D. Uh, figure out how to be effective at studying. Figure out how to make the intellectual growth of importance to you and then get excited about the results. That's the better way to uh, uh, to think about it. All right, so that's a little bit of background, and hopefully that'll get you to talk to me more often and and, uh, and to get it to work for you. That's that's the main thing. Let's get into some economics. Start with a definition. Uh, what's one of the many definitions of economics? One of them is it's the painful elaboration of the obvious. Economics is about how to make rational decisions, or about how other people do that. And once you figure that out, maybe it tells you how you should. So since it's about what people do that's rational, describe rationality, well, ultimately it becomes obvious. So the painful elaboration of the obvious means that eventually you're going to go, duh, or you should. If you haven't studied long enough, or if you haven't gotten to duh, that means you haven't studied long enough. Okay? So... If you're struggling with some graph, I have some graphs here I can go to. Should I go with to them now? Not yet. I'll rip this. There's a bunch of them there. If you're struggling with some graph and, and all you can memorize is a bunch of shapes and triangles and rectangles and P's and Q's and you can't figure out why, why things are actually the way they are, uh, you're never going to get to duh. And you're probably not learning anything, uh, which is pretty expensive in many different ways. Uh, but you're definitely not having fun. So let's not do that. Let's uh, try to figure out a way to be connected to the material to learn what it is. One way to think about it is suppose you look at a toolbox and you look in there and there's a hammer. Okay, So you've recognized that it's a hammer. Can you do anything with it? Right? If, <laughs> if you memorize stuff, you could probably recognize that it's a hammer. But you probably wouldn't know how to knock in very many nails. Some maybe. You know, they're short and fat and they won't bend. But a lot of others, you hit them and you might hurt your finger and you might bend the nail and you, and you might not get it to go in all the way into the wood. You might not know which nail is the right one or which hammer, why some hammers are better than others. Don't do that. Make sure you know how to use the hammer, not just recognize that it is. Okay, so the same thing is true of economic tools. Don't just get to the point where you know, oh, that's a supply and demand graph or that's a production possibilities frontier and oh, that's a supply line and that's a demand line. Get in the habit of understanding why it slopes upward and it slopes downward and why the intersection matters and why the one is the price and the other one's the quantity and why multiplying one times the other is something else that's important. Okay, so the painful elaboration of the obvious is one way to perceive economics. It's all about scarcity, so that's kind of the critical issue. Uh, 
uh, studying people coping with scarcity, another way to think about what economics is. All our choices are costly, which is why a lot of people call economics the dismal science, because we're all always talking about uh, the downside of things. Consequences. If you do this, you can't do that. Okay? If you give up, if you do this, you can do that. If you do this, you can't do that. You give up one to do the other. And that's one of the reasons that politicians often make fun of econom economists, although they listen to them, maybe not as much as they should. Uh, but the often use us as punching bags is because they don't like to be told what the consequences of all their rosy promises are. And by the way, I'm recording this the, uh, one of the days between the two uh, Republic, between the Republican and Democrat National Convention, so I'm just kind of deluged by promises, most of which may be sincere, but will, in light of scarcity, uh, be difficult uh, to keep. Uh, okay, so people uh, spending and earning income, right? That behavior, that's, we're studying economics there if we're looking at people earning and spending income, because in both cases they're coping with scarcity. They're only able to earn a certain amount of income given their skills and market conditions, and then they've had this limited amount of income that they wish would buy a lot more than it does. And so that's one another way to look at economics. Uh, another way to look at it is that it's price theory. There's a lot about prices in this course. Why is that? Well, because price formation and price impact is a lot, a lot about what guides decision making. Okay, people make choices. That creates shortages and surpluses of goods and services, and then that changes the prices, and then they change their choices, and so it goes back and forth. And by the way, two of the most important things you can learn all semester long, I'll put them right up front right here, and they'll be mentioned several more times, and I'll regard us both as failures if you don't understand what these things mean by the end of the semester. All right, so when we look at how economic systems decide what's going to be produced, how it's going to be produced, where it's going to be produced, and how it is going to be distributed. Markets are the default ways to do that. What are markets? That's just people trying to find good deals, find good deals for use of their labor and other things that they own, good deals for how they spend their limited amount of income. And how do markets work on their own when left alone? You observe prices. You enter the marketplace, and you learn what you have to give up to get certain things. Uh, either in terms of how much time you have to work to make enough money to earn something, uh, or how much of something you can't buy if you buy something else. It all comes down to prices, which are initially specified in dollars usually, but which ultimately come down to uh, how much of something your time it takes to acquire something, or how much of something you give up in order to be able to have the money available to buy something else. Okay, so those prices fall and rise as a result of what? As a result of shortages and surpluses that arise in the market. In a free market, shortages and surpluses don't last very long, but their temporary appearance is what causes prices to rise and fall. So here's the, one of those two big things that you need to not just memorize, because I'm going to make sure I do torture you to figure out if you just memorized it and don't understand it. One of the critical functions of that constant change in prices in markets is to ration out what's available. At any given moment, there's a certain amount of stuff available, okay, and lots of, 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 of all kinds of stuff. And in each case, there may be a little bit more or a little bit less than people actually want to buy at the existing long-standing, maybe long-standing, but the price that people expected to pay, okay? There may be a surplus, a little bit more than people want to buy, there may be a shortage. In other words, it's being purchased faster than, it, than firms are replenishing it based on the existing price. And so then what happens? Okay, ration out what's available means to make sure that it all sells. And not more than all, that it all lasts until we can make more. Okay, so if it's selling a little faster, uh, then new production is arriving at wherever it's selling. We have a shortage prices are going to go up. Why are they going to go up? Because sellers would love to be able to raise their prices. After all, we know that they're all, well, maybe not all, a lot of them are at least trying to survive, pay their bills, and many of them are trying to make as much money as they can and while they can because they know it's tough out there and you know you get, you get your income when you can, your profit when you can. 
And so if there's a shortage and it's moving faster than they're used to, they're glad to raise their prices. And what will that do? Well, that'll increase the rate at which the stuff shows up to sell because it's now more profitable. And some people will say, at that higher price, no. The lower price, fine. Higher price, no. I don't want it at all, or I'd rather buy something else. Okay? So ration out what's available means to change supply and demand in the short run. Okay? So this is not easy to claim supply much in the short run, but to change it maybe a little bit if it can change in the short run to match the amount that people want to buy. Okay? So prices fluctuate in the short run so that all that's available to sell is the amount that does sell, not more, not less. The result of that process in the short run, the price that's established to move out what's available to sell and not have it, but not have any shortages, provides information and incentives what to make in the future and for buyers how much to plan to buy in the future. So in the short run, that's number one, ration out what's available. Price change to ration out what's available in the long run. Price change provides inf information and incentives about which markets to participate in. Right? So, for example, if the price of something has been going up, to ration out what's available. Lately, it seems to be like guns are one of those things because people are worried about the violence and they won't be able to protect themselves. So they're, they're going off to the store to buy a gun for themselves so that if the bad guys come after them, they don't have to wait for the cops to show up so they can protect themselves. And I'm not passing any judgment on that. That has, you know, the guns that are out there for people to protect themselves can fall into the wrong hands. And so it's one of those many controversial things that economics can shed light on but not, to, not resolve. All right, so the demand has increased. I bet you the sales and the discounts are less than they used to be. and Maybe even the posted prices have gone up to ration out what's available. That will induce market entry into the gun market. The existing producers will make more. Some, somebody who's thinking about what business they should make their living from will decide to produce guns instead of deciding to produce something else. Some people will decide that, you know, those guns are pretty expensive. It's a kind of safe neighborhood where I am, maybe, maybe, and, and my kids might find a gun and do bad things with it, you know, and they're doing this considering pros and cons, and a higher price kind of tips the balance and says, nah. Okay, so as a result of the higher price, the existing guns are not in short supply, and in the future, more guns will be produced, and that may cause the price to go back down to where it had been before. Okay, so that's the market mechanism, the price mechanism in action, and that's what economists study. Price theory is how prices change and how price change causes other changes. All right, so that's some definitions of economics. There are others. Uh, they all surround the issue of scarcity. We can move on to another issue, and that is the difference between positive and normative economics. Positive economics is mostly what we do, but just to, so you'll know the difference, occasionally we go over into, okay, what does this mean for policy? Or how might some people view what this means for policy that other people might not, dis might not agree with? Okay, so the positive economics is the stuff that, e that economists typically almost universally agree on. Things like if the price goes up, the quantity purchased, all other things being the same will go down. Okay, not much disagreement on that. Well, none that I know of. Uh, normative economics is, okay, given that, what does that mean for some policies? One of the ones, that policy that's been under quite a bit of discussion lately is the minimum wage, and we'll get back into that in a later chapter. But there's a case where economists agree that if you mandate a wage increase, that if, the, say, the going rate in the market's eight bucks an hour, and now you say, no, it's against the law to pay anybody less than $10 an hour, that some firms that would have hired X amount of workers, that firms that would have hired X amount of workers will not hire that many anymore at the higher price. The law of demand. Okay, higher price, less will be purchased. Some economists will say, well, gosh, uh, fewer job openings, mm, let's not have a minimum wage. Other economists have said, yeah, I agree with that. The law of demand applies. Higher wage, higher price tag on unskilled labor. Not as many people will be hired. But some will be paid more, and I think that's worth it, that some will be paid nothing at all, okay? Especially if they think that that's a small amount. 
Okay, so intelligent people, including intelligent economists, disagree on whether minimum wages at some levels, okay, for example, and some economists might say that a $10 minimum wage is worth the loss of some job openings. Others will say, no, it's not. And some of the ones that think $10 an hour is okay will say, yeah, but $15 an hour is not okay. So again, depending on the differences, values that apply to the outcomes and also disagreement on the outcomes. They all agree on, yeah, there'll be fewer jobs, but they don't agree on how much fewer jobs there will be. They disagree on how much less labor will be purchased at higher prices than some others uh, do. Okay, so there are good grounds for informed disagreement. Uh, it's all around us. One of the grounds for informed disagreement is that efficiency isn't everything. It's pretty much everything we're going to focus on. Okay, but go to a public hearing on anything and start uh, harassing or haranguing the, volu the, I mean, the volunteers, the politicians that are sitting there listening to the testimony and uh, you can talk to them about efficiency and they'll listen. But that means that they're not going to say, oh, that's the most efficient thing. Yeah, that's what we ought to do. No, they, they might uh, very well say, well, that's fine. But there's these other things that we are concerned about and that we might be willing to want to say these exact words. We're probably willing to do a balancing act between different things that we value. Efficiency is one of those. And we may forego some efficiency for equity or stability or freedom or whatever, a lot of other things that cost efficiency or could. They don't always. Uh, not all goals are competing. Uh, not all goals are involve trade-offs. And by the way, that's one of these big ideas that we're in. That's big idea number three. Because of scarcity, there will be conflicting objectives. I don't want to buy this and this. I don't have enough money. Which one am I going to buy? Oh, well, I value this one a little bit more, so I'll forego this one to have the money to buy that one. Trade-offs are ubiquitous. And that's a fancy word for everywhere. Sorry, an occupational hazard of being a professor. Sometimes we use big words. Actually, big, ubiquitous isn't any longer than everywhere, is it? Bigger sounding words uh, in place of obvious words that mean the same thing. All right, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, what are the big ideas? I'm not going to list them. I'll just go through them one at a time uh, that uh, we should be aware of at the beginning of a microeconomics course. Number three, as I said, was trade-offs. I won't go over that one again. But I've skipped the first two, so I better get into those. Number one is incentives matter. And, uh, of course, then a rational, immediate reaction to this is, well, duh. Yeah, incentives matter. Uh, but we have to understand exactly what that means. And, and why we have this as a big idea rather than as a trivial idea is because we don't always recognize what is self-interest and what it means and how it'll change behavior. For example, did you know that changes in tax laws can impact birth rates? Can you picture people planning their family with the IRS tax code as one of the things they look at? Sounds kind of silly, but people value children uh, but sometimes not enough to finance the one, the additional ones. In other words, cost is a factor in planning family size. And if it's cheaper to have kids, they might have more kids. And if it's more expensive to have kids. And economic research has shown that to be the case. Uh, after tax laws change in a way to make children cheaper, um, family size goes up. All other things that affect family size taken into account, all else equal. Uh, the tax law seems to have induced some families to be larger than they otherwise would be. Some people owe their existence uh, to the 1998, uh, 1988 law that, uh, that made it cheaper to have kids than, it, than, than prior to that. A fact, uh, in the Soviet Union, as an interesting example, uh, wow, I'm getting old now. This is before some of you were born. The Soviet Union went away in 1991. Wow. But in that old system, which was uh, socialism in action, uh, incentives mattered in some weird ways. The central government says, here's our quota for glass production. This, this is one example. And kind of strange, one of the things you learn about central planning is it's, it's hard to be detail intensive, but our economy is every, everything. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that uh, glass, all four, all kinds of products in which glass is a part of. How about the central government didn't know a way how to specify all of those. They couldn't anticipate all of them. So they just said, 
here's how much glass we need to produce, okay, as a whole. So they specified a, a total quota of glass production, and they assigned that to all of the different factories that were capable of doing that. Some of the factories said, okay, we have to, and they, spe they specified that in, in tons. So some of the factories, I don't know if they were trying to be funny or, or just educate the uh, central planners or what, but they said, okay, I, my share of the quota is five tons of glass. Here it is, a big chunk of glass. Weighs five tons. I guess uh, good for a paperweight if you're Paul Bunyan. <laughs> Other than that, it has no use whatsoever. I guess it's in a museum probably somewhere now. Uh, and so it has a function in, uh, in getting people to roll their eyes or to laugh. But it didn't have any use when it was produced uh, for making windows, you know, or, uh, or whatever uh, that, uh, that glass might be used for. Ha! Ah! The central planners wised up and said, you know, maybe we should specify the quota in terms of uh, 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 square meters of glass produced. Well, then some of the factories produced glass so thin that if you had a, a slight breeze, it would break. Just as useful as the big cubes, but hey, Mr. Uh, Politburo, here's your uh, 50 uh, square feet of uh, glass, our, sh our quota. Silly stuff. Uh, but incentives matter, and if you specify things in certain ways, you know, don't be surprised if, if people do more of something than you thought maybe that you wanted them to or expected them to. And incentive uh, uh, matter uh, means that self-interest matters, which means that to explain the behavior of some people, we better have a pretty broad view of self-interest. Because if you have a really narrow view of it as, as materialism and access to goods and services, then a lot of people stand out as seemingly irrational. And you study them or get to know them, and they seem every, anything but irrational. They seem quite rational. Yet they seem to have chosen less for themselves, selfishly speaking, in favor of more for other people. Soldiers jump on grenades thrown in their foxhole. They die, but it saves all of their comrades. At the instant that they made that choice, it seemed rational to give their lives quickly. They were going to die anyway if somebody else didn't jump on the grenade. And, you know, so they said, I might as well jump on the grenade. I'm gone, but I'll be gone anyway, if, even if no one else does. So that seemed like a rational thing to do, even though it was an entirely altruistic act at the moment, because, hey, somebody else might have jumped on the grenade, and then they would have died instead of them. Okay? So altruism is absolutely consistent with, with, uh, with self-interest, and that incentives matter. Uh, incentives and in, in, in mattering and self-interest has to be broadly defined for it to successfully be part of our economic attempts, uh, economic analysis attempting to explain peop why people do what they do. Another big idea, number two, uh, is that uh, good institutions matter. Uh, and the good institute, and so by the way, it's also number seven. I'm not sure why they separated into two. I'm only going to talk about it once, so I'm going to skip number seven. But good institutions matter. What, what does that mean? Is that you're talking about buildings? It's, no, no, no. I mean, yeah, good buildings like the one I'm standing in matters too. I'm on the second floor. I'm counting on it being strong enough not to collapse. I'm relying on the architects and the engineers. Anyway, no, no, that's not what I mean by institutions matter, even though they do matter in that sense also. No, and to economic analysis, what institutions means is like the rules of the game, the overlying conditions under which people specialize and engage in trade, spend income, pursue earning income, do altruistic acts, all of that. Uh, just to give you an example of what we do mean by uh, these institutions and specific rules, it's like courts that enforce contracts fairly and impartially and don't favor some people over others because they have connections. That's a critical institution in align, align, aligning pursuit of self-interest with positive social outcomes. Uh, I won't go over any others. That's just one example of a rule or a tradition that's vital in causing pursuit of self-interest to, to cause uh, and to improve social outcomes. Uh, if you provide an incentive for people to benefit at public expense, they will. Now, not everybody, of course. 
Some people revere the law for its own sake above else, but some people don't, and if breaking the law will benefit them at public expense and they think they can get away with it, they'll do it. Okay? So incentives can matter in ways that you don't anticipate, wish that they didn't happen like in the Soviet Union. Uh, try to discern how self-interest will be affected when you change your own behavior or when the government purports or announces that it's going to change the rules of the game. All right, so number one was incentives matter. Number two is good institutions align self-interest and the social interest. Number three was trade-offs are everywhere. I went over that a few minutes ago. Number four is thinking on the margin is the way people behave, and that is because they have to, because they're used to, even though they don't know what's thinking on the margin, and even though uh, they didn't have that name, they didn't know it had a name, marginal analysis. Uh, let, let me just let me follow with, uh, just go from there with a couple of examples, and then here's where my graphs that are hidden come in. I'll get into those in a minute, just to illustrate further what, what, uh, what that is. Uh, when, when recently have you probably been thinking at the margin? Uh, constantly, probably. But two, I can, can predict and, and maybe it's easy to talk about. How about when life changes, like the starting of a semester, and you have to ponder when to get up in the morning? That's marginal analysis. Your alarm clock, maybe your cell phone serves as your alarm clock, is probably set to uh, at least wake you up at a certain time or if you're in the habit of hitting the snooze button, to begin to wake you up. Uh, in the morning and so now the semester is starting which probably changed your schedule and your priorities and so now you're reconsidering the time that you have set on there let's say it's 6 30 in the morning now you're thinking maybe I should get up earlier you know traffic out to UTSA is kind of bad and maybe if I get up earlier I'll get there without having to spend time stuck in traffic and if I get there earlier I'll get a better parking spot this time of year under a shade tree is nice but in any event closer to the buildings Okay, so you're weighing all of these things with, I hate to get out of bed in the morning and some extra sleep sure would be nice. And so you're making a decision at the margin, probably one minute at a time or 10 minutes at a time. And so maybe uh, 6.30 being your starting point, maybe you back it up to 6 o'clock. So what you've said with your behavior, just did some marginal analysis, is that now with the changes, with the onset of the semester, that those last 30 minutes of sleep that you've gotten used to are just not too costly. They are, they, they are just not worth it anymore. And that now at 6 o'clock, additional sleep is just barely worth the cost of getting into things a little later, whereas before that had been at 6.30. Okay, so you evaluated a minute or two at a time whether additional sleep was worth uh, less of other things, and you made a choice. How about almost every day when you're thinking about how hard to press on the gas pedal of your car? Isn't it awesome we live in a, in a society where I can assume that almost all of you have a car? You can't assume that through much of history or through much of the world. But anyway, most of you have a car, and you can go out on the highway, you can see that people have different choices about how fast to drive. They're all doing marginal analysis, reaching different conclu conclusions about how fast to drive. They're weighing, getting there sooner with additional gas consumption, the probability of getting a ticket, and, and whether being late is going to be penalized, maybe by their boss or getting into class late. And so as, you, as your foot moves on the gas pedal, uh, you're doing marginal analysis, reaching conclusions that the previous optimum amount of speed uh, has changed by some, they maybe just saw a cop. Uh, or Maybe you just learned that most of the cops are in unmarked vehicles and now you can't even tell whether they're around anymore. Oops, better slow down. I don't know if there is one around. Uh, anyway, so you're making all those. Those are all, that's all marginal analysis in action. And it turns out that we have what I call at least the economic golden rule. And that is that the best amount of anything from the perspective of the person choosing or the firm choosing or the governmental entity choosing or society having a choice or being presented with the consequence of a bunch of choices, the best amount of anything from the decision maker's perspective is defined by where the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. Okay, now, since I've thrown some hieroglyphics out there, 
perhaps a new term. Maybe I better define what all of those are and how they relate. So I'll do that. Let me stick that over this bottom graph so it doesn't distract you. I'll get into it in a minute. But the way the world seems to work for most goods and services is that the total benefits for anything change with quantity this way. That the more you have of something, the better things are, but that the increase occurs at a decreasing rate. So if we graph the rate of increase, we get what's called marginal benefit. The change in the total benefit, change in, with a change in quantity of one. Okay, so increase at a decreasing rate means that the rate of increase is, de is decreasing. Okay, the amount of additional benefit with quantity is getting smaller. You see here when it flattens out, the change in total benefit is zero, which means the change in the total benefit is zero. There it is. If the increase is at an increasing rate, which seems to be the way the opportunity costs, okay, what you give up to do something works most of the time in the real world, you get increase, increasing rate, which means the change in the total gets bigger and bigger the bigger our quantity is. When you do the first unit of something, you may not give up anything at all to do it. Maybe it's something easily done in the course of your already existing fares. But to do a lot of it might take a total revamping of your schedule and the way you spend your money. So you see, the last unit of something might be much more costly than the first unit. Makes sense. And the reason that I allege that it makes sense is we've done the research and we've shown that that's the case. And that's the way people behave. They don't go all the way to the maximum benefit of something because before they get there, it costs more than it's worth. Not worthless. It's worth less. Notice the difference. It's not worthless past Q star. Yeah, it has a value more than zero. But it's worth less than what you have to give up to do it. All right. So there's some of the hieroglyphics and the explanation of it. Marginal benefit declines from high to low as you go from left to right, as you go from zero quantity to bigger values, because the total benefit rises at, an, at a decreasing rate. Marginal cost rises, okay, the change in the total goes up at an increasing rate. Each additional unit costs more than the previous one. Okay? If this is 100 Q star, that's a star, then the 101st unit of this good costs more than its value. Its value is positive, but it's less than the cost. All right, so that's marginal analysis. Let me give you another example of marginal analysis or trying to figure out what the marginal cost of something is. Let's say that you can buy something. Sorry, my eyes are watering a little bit. Let's say you can buy something for 22 cents, but also you can buy it for a dollar if you buy five of them. Okay? Process that for a moment. One costs 22 cents. If you buy two, it'll cost 44 cents. If you buy three, it'll cost 66 cents. If you buy four, it'll cost 88 cents. But since it's five for a dollar, if you buy five, it's a dollar. Ah, the fifth one has a marginal cost of 12 cents to the purchaser. Okay, there you go. You just found a mar. How'd you do that? How'd you find that marginal cost? A dollar minus 88 cents. That's how you find marginal whatever cost benefit. You subtract what the total is, a dollar, you buy five, from what the total is for one unit less. Right? If you spend, if you want four, it's 88 cents. 12 more cents will get you five. The marginal cost of the fifth one is 12 cents. All right? Now back to this notion of rational behavior, because I thought of an example that will illustrate that. Suppose it's 25 cents each or five for a dollar. Okay? Does that make it irrational not to buy five instead of four? Four of them will be a buck, right? Four times 25 cents. Five for a dollar. Why would you take the fifth one? Well, it's free in terms of money, right? At the margin, it's no additional cost. That's what free means. No additional cost. See, hey, you spent a buck, but the fifth one was free. Now, free in terms of money. But does that make it totally free? Does that make it have no cost? Well, it depends on how big it is and how 
smelly it is maybe, how dusty it is. I can tell you from experience, having goofed around with concrete, a concrete example, concrete, quickcrete, a product, that even at a price of zero, it's not free. Uh, 80 pound bag, even a 40 pound bag, I mean, that's heavy and it gets dust on your clothes and I've got to find some place to put it at home until I use it that won't get any water on it. And so I wanted to pick it up in a dead lift because 80 pounds is a lot. See, it might be free in terms of money and that fact may make a lot of people buy five instead of four. But a lot of people still might say, yeah, I don't have to pay any more money for that fifth one, but I don't have any place to put it. And my back is kind of shot after picking up four of these to load into my truck, much less unloading it at home and putting it somewhere. And I'm running out of space to put it. So opportunity cost is more than money. So free in terms of money, no additional cost, does not make it overly free. You might think it irrational to buy uh, just four instead of five. Most people would for their, themselves to say, yeah, well, no additional money cost, yeah, buy that fifth one. But some people would still say, it's no additional money cost if it's 25 cents each, but five for a dollar. But still, I'm only going to buy four. All right, so now you know that marginal analysis involves what in, in your brain, some subtraction. The total benefit with this condition, driving, say, at 65 miles an hour, versus the total benefit if you only drive 60 miles an hour, and the difference, that's the marginal benefit of the five additional miles an hour. Okay. Marginal analysis involves the mental exercise of doing subtraction. All right. So uh, now one other kind of an interesting way of thinking about marginal analysis is trash pickup service. Why is that an interesting way of thinking about it? Because it's usually billed by a flat fee. There, it's free. And, well, wait a minute. Doc, you just said I have to pay for it. Yeah, but there's, it's no additional cost for additional quantity. So people will treat it like it's free, even though they're billed every month for it. Right? The amount you're billed is not going to be affected by whether you put the maximum out there that your back or the trash receptacle cans can hold or whether you go on vacation a month and you didn't put any trash while you were gone. No change in the amount you'll be billed. Here in San Antonio, it's part of our city public service electricity bill. Just a flat fee. No additional charge. So that being the case, people will say, well, here's the amount I'm going to consume. Why? Well, because the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost to them of zero when the marginal benefit hits zero. Okay? So let's reveal something else that I scribbled down here. Whoops, did I scribble it down here? That's in somewhere else. I'm misremembering one of my graphs. But I can tell you what it is. If you heard the phrase, if you think it's expensive now, wait till it's free which means no additional car charge if you buy more or consume more. That's what free means effectively. Well, now you have some understanding of why it is. If it's no additional charge, here's how much people will consume. And it'll cost a lot more to produce that much than to produce this much, which is if we let the market resolve the amount that it should cost. i go down to my other graph now. Right, if we think in terms of demand and supply, which I'm just going to barely touch on today because that's chapter three and four, because people's demand for things is a function of their perception of its value to them. And the firm's supplying things is a function of their costs, right? marginal costs. So demand and marginal benefit. Are, I'm not going to get into the DWL. That comes up later in the semester. Uh, I wrote this graph for another use, and I'm not getting double duty out of it. Uh, but if this is the market outcome, the market equilibrium, you have much less spending on this good than if this is the outcome because there's no additional charge for charging, for buying more of it, or for using more of it because it's charged like trash pickup with just a month, monthly uh, flat, flat fee. All right. Because I'm not going to use this graph anymore, I'm going to cover it again. Let's see, because I recorded this, you can go rewind and look at it, at it again later if you want to, or start it from scratch again later if maybe you want to review it again. And, uh, and you should in some cases. By the way, speaking of supply and demand and the law of supply and demand, you don't really know exactly what those are yet. Well, 
I guess they're kind of basic. The law of supply is higher price, more will be supplied. Law of demand, lower price, less will, uh, more will be purchased. All right, so there they are in kind of raw form. Tampering, this is big idea number five now, tampering with the laws of supply and demand uh, has serious consequences, usually bad. Okay, that just basically says we've learned from experience that what happens naturally from people pursuing the best possible deals they can find, uh, constrained by it costs money to get things from people, you have to pay them, right? there are market prices, and uh, you can't steal it, property rights will be enforced by the government. Uh, interfering with that basic mechanism usually produces disastrous results, we suffer huge losses. Not always, some little minor uh, tinkering and fine tuning is sometimes beneficial, but sometimes thinking you're gonna do the minor fine tuning uh, produces outcomes that you didn't anticipate that are worse, make things worse rather than better. Uh, so tampering with the laws of supply and demand by mandating certain things or mandating certain prices has serious concepts. Let me just give one a quick example. Talked about the minimum wage earlier. Economists disagree up to certain levels, uh, varying by economist on how much higher, if at all, the uh, payment to unskilled labor should be above the market rate. Uh, and another example of perhaps a temptation to interfere with the market that has been widely regretted, but still uh, resistant to changing once it happens is rent controls, right? In other words, a constraint on what your landlord can charge you. Isn't that, doesn't that sound attractive at first? Don't you wish your rent would just kind of suddenly go down or there was like a letter from your landlord that says, you know, if the rent had been 400 a month, I'm only gonna charge 300 a month this month. Whoa, if you had an opportunity to go into a voting booth and go, boop, and it would cause your rent to drop by 100 a month. That's a pretty hard temptation to resist. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we like to educate people in economics because you probably better resist that temptation. You might actually benefit for a while if you're in the apartment already. You know, the law passes and they had been charging 400, now it's illegal, now they can't charge more than 300. You're gonna save 100 bucks. But for several reasons, you and other people might regret that because now not as many apartments will be built because it's not as profitable as before. More people will want their own apartments. You know, people that had roommates will say, at $400 a month, I want a roommate. At uh, $300 a month, I want my own apartment. That darn roommate, he never washes dishes, doesn't keep things clean, and I'll tolerate to save myself a couple hundred dollars, right? Split that $400 rent. But if I can have my own place for $300, I'm gonna do that. So what I'm saying is that the lower price reduces the quantity supplied and increases the quantity demanded. Voila, we have a shortage, and it's illegal to raise the price, so the price can't raise, rise as it normally would, which is why I was at 400 to begin with, to alleviate that shortage we're gonna have a persistent shortage, right? Because the politicians aren't gonna all instantly go, oops, and uh, let's not do that. Uh, because a lot of the people that are gaining will say, uh -uh, no, I like my rent at $300, don't you mess with it. Also, uh, okay, so uh, there's less supply, there's gonna be shortages and persistent shortages have consequences. One of those is reduced quality, right? So you might be in your apartment at $400 a month at first, and then now, by virtue of political action, boop, wasn't that easy, right? You voted for the candidate that pr pr promised rent controls, now you're saving on your rent money, but suddenly the landlord's not all that responsive to your demands for fixing things. If you leave, they just got a waiting list that uh, was willing to accept the apartment, even with the, the thing that you wish that they would fix. Okay? And because they don't fix things quite as fast, or if at all anymore, uh, the apartment starts to deteriorate, but still there's plenty of demand at the $300 price to keep it filled. The landlord's saving money on maintenance. See, quality reduction is a inherent outcome of uh, persistent shortages. Uh, people are gonna cut corners if they can get away with it, puts more money in their pocket. Not everybody, but some people are gonna react to that incentive in ways that we wish that they wouldn't. All right, so there's an example of the temptation to tamper politically with the laws of supply and demand and the ultimate regret to do that. A few years ago in California, there was a proposition on the ballot to reduce insurance rates, and it passed. 
And I can't remember if they've uh, repealed it or, or what, but not too, many, not too long after that, there was some uh, uh, voter remorse because a lot of the insurers left the states. And yeah, sure, if you could get a policy to cover certain things, it would only cost a certain amount. But you couldn't get one. So it was like, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, they, I can, uh, certain kind of insurance will only cost X, but I can't find it at that price. I can't find it at any price now because charging more than X is against the law. So anyway, there are a lot of temptations uh, to tamper. Most of them are a bad idea because of the down the road information and incentive effects, as well as the immediate uh, shortage, in some places surplus, but usually shortage effects of uh, tampering with uh, market generated uh, outcomes, both in terms of price and quantity. All right, that's number five. We're gonna do number six, and then that's gonna be the end of this uh, short video. That'll be uh, a part two that I'll record in a couple minutes, but yeah, you don't have to watch it right away. All right, number six in the list of uh, big ideas of, econo uh, of economics, uh, the importance of wealth and economic growth. I think the best I example I can give of, of this other than, yeah, economic growth is nice because that means my paycheck will go up faster than the prices of things. And I'll, my, my, if I'm an average person, my income will stretch further. Sure, that's cool. But maybe there is things going on in the side, side effects of economic growth, traffic, pollution. Maybe it isn't worth it. And my message to you is that we can manage it in a way that it more than likely is worth it, especially since experience has shown that those places with more rapid economic growth typically have better environments. Yeah, they create challenges, people having more income to spend or more stuff, and it takes resources and process to make more stuff, but that seems to be more than offset by the effect of increased income and increased growth on people's willingness to pay for pollution controls and setting aside land to, that's protected from alteration to, you know, to leave it in its natural state rather than uh, using it to uh, produce uh, raw materials to be changed into goods and services. All right, so wealth and economic growth are important for at least that reason, the nice reason of it being able to get more out of your labor. Uh, another one that's worth mentioning, especially since I've just been watching uh, one of the political conventions, and it's just like all other political conventions, the politicians promise a lot. And experience has shown that uh, scarcity will uh, temper their wishes, and they typically, even with the best of intentions, will not be able to promise all that they did. And one of the reasons that wealth and economic growth are nice is because, well, they'll be able to meet They'll be able to prom uh, keep more of their promises. And one of their promises might not be made. That's probably more important than anything. From time to time, the effect of freedom on unequal earnings. Some people exercising their freedom are able to get a better price for their labor than others. And so some people make more than others, and that seems unfair. And so then that generates a demand for redistribution of income, which can be resisted sometimes by violence. And so if the economy grows faster, sometimes there's less pressure on the politicians to promise to do things with, that might slow economic growth or prompt violence. Uh, they promise things that would redistribute income to cause people to have more than they've earned through just the market, while others would not get to keep all of that they have earned through the market mechanism. All right, number seven was in institutions matter, but I think I covered that under number two, which is about institutions. So that'll do it for part one of our intro to uh, microeconomics. Uh, 